Now I'm going to tell you a dream from, not a dream, a vision from a 15-year-old Jewish boy who died for 15 minutes. How many of you have heard this before? This is very exciting, and this is the, the buzz among the end-time community. If you're into end times, you'll definitely uh, be into this dream. Uh, this Jewish boy, his name is Natan. We'll say Nathan in English. We'll anglicize it. Uh, Nathan died for 15 minutes on the first day of Sukkot 2015, which was the day we preached about the fourth blood moon. And that blood moon is a sign to the Jews. The blood moons are assigned to the Jews. The eclipse, solar eclipses on God's holy days are assigned to the Gentiles, most of us. So it doesn't surprise me at all that on that fourth blood moon, and we're in that season, we're in this, this time right now where the four blood moons announce something major for Israel, uh, he died and saw something. Um, Nathan had no religious upbringing. In fact, his parents are against his vision and threaten the synagogue to sue it for posting his vision on YouTube. Nathan was interviewed by an Orthodox rabbi named Eliezer Hagadol, who ignored his parents' threats and uh, put it up on YouTube. So it's very hard to follow this interview because it's long and it's all in Hebrew. So I'm going to read it to you in English, summarize it for you. But before I do that, I just want to show like a one-minute clip so that you at least see it's a real Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He's very strict with this boy. This is a real secular boy. He knows nothing about the Bible. Take a look at a minute of the interview. When the soul leaves the body, it can receive a huge amount of information that would take years for a person here in this world to learn. One can understand within a matter of minutes, everything. So he has a lot to tell. It's hard for him to tell it. He doesn't know the exact words to describe what he experienced. Hey, can you just fast forward so we can hear his voice a little bit? Things that do not relate to this world. He saw planet Earth from above. He kept le going up, leaving his body. I don't know how to explain it suddenly. Out of nowhere, I entered a sort of tunnel, really huge. At the end of the tunnel, a very small light. I was in a tunnel. I don't know how to explain it. There were circles, more circles. Inside, lots and lots of souls. I started walking. The lights got bigger and bigger. Finally, you reach that light. Obviously, whenever ever somebody says that they have had a vision or gone to heaven, you've got to test it with the Word of God. That's always the standard. But I do believe that this is a genuine vision because the things that Nathan said are basically he's preached my sermon that I've been preaching about end times for 15 years through a lot of study he just got in a few minutes. And there's no way that he could have gotten it without the study. And not only that, he's not from a religious family, so he wouldn't have even overheard it in a sermon. He doesn't attend the synagogue. Now he does. So something supernatural happened to him. Some of the ways that he describes things sounds to me like a Jewish way of describing. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's wrong, but it wouldn't agree with the way that we would say it. But I think if God was reaching out to somebody, like a Buddhist, he'd speak to a Buddhist in a Buddhist language. If he speaks to a Jew, he'd reach out to a Jew in Jewish language. So you've got to give it a little bit of leeway that God is quite bigger than the Christian box that we put him in. You understand that? God is bigger than the Christian box you and I put him in. So he describes certain things in a very Jewish way. Let's start from where it's relevant. Rabbi Eliezer Haggadol said, quote, Let's get back to the tour. Let's call it a tour. After they showed you that there is Gan Eden, Gan Eden literally means in Hebrew the Garden of Eden, but it's now a term that they use for the afterlife. All right? After they showed you that there is Gan Eden, and after they showed you that there is Gehenom, which is hell, a huge reward for mitzvot, which is obeying the commands, and severe punish punishment for transgressions, even for the smallest trans transgressions, then they sent you back to where? Right. So this was, uh, you're missing like many minutes of stuff, so let me just explain. One of the things that he realized was when you go up to heaven, the things that you did wrong are so embarrassing. He says they tell everything. 
they go from start to finish. From the start of your life at the moment of birth to the very end. And he says they can do it in seconds. And it's extremely humiliating. And he says just the little thing that you think wasn't a big deal, it's such a big deal in heaven. But then he said this, but then when you do something that obeys the word of God, he says even though it seems so little to you when you go to heaven, they make such a huge deal about it. It's such a big deal. You obeyed God. And he said, even a small thing like keeping the, you know, they have the, um, what are they called? The uh, tassels that the Jews are supposed to keep. Right? Even just that tiny little thing, they make such a huge deal about it. Everything you give, your attitude, huge rewards in heaven. All right? So the rabbis were very happy about that because this is the orthodox rabbi, the strictest of all the rabbis. So God in heaven is very strict. Some people call that legalism today, but it's actually quite godly. So now, the rabbi said, where did they send you to? Nathan said, so in the beginning, the moment I saw Gan Eden, I said, I want to stay here. I want to stay here. But after that, they showed me the other side and all that. It speaks like a teenager. They asked me if I wanted to stay. I said, I would prefer to go back down. Why? Because I felt that if I went back down, I could do more mitzvot. That means obeying the commandments of God. Earn more reward, more of everything. I could like earn a greater reward and do more mitzvot and reach an even higher level. So why would I want to stay there and not do that? So I said I would rather go back down and they sent me back down. I feel this is a very Jewish understanding of the afterlife. You know, Christians have a very nebulous, unclear picture of heaven. But a Jew went up to heaven and says, it's an economy. There, there are rewards, there are incentives, and I would like, I see the incentives. Living for God and doing anything good for God on earth, living for eternity, is going to put me in a very good economic position forever. So I'd rather come back down and invest and keep investing in my life so that I'll have eternal rewards up there. You know, for a Jewish boy who doesn't even know the Messiah to speak that is to our shame. Because many of us Christians live day to day as if God wasn't real. And, and you know, we, the best measure of our Christian life is our Christian prayer. And many Christians don't really have an intimate relationship with God day to day. God really seeks that of us, a day-to-day -day experience with Him, lots of time with Him, long hours of studying the Bible and praying. That's good. That's not passe. That's not out of fad. That is in fad in heaven. They make a huge deal of that in heaven. Amen? That's why I keep encouraging. I want to see the whole church come to power prayer, come to extended hours of prayer. I still have never seen the whole church come, but I'm still dreaming of that. Uh, the rabbi then asked, this is the one they want to know. Could you know who the Mashiach was? And the Mashiach is the original word for Christ. They want to know who is the Christ, who is the Messiah. Nathan, I couldn't know. I could only know what his traits were. And I think God is smart to do that. If God had revealed that it's Yeshua, Jesus, immediately the rabbis would have said, forget it. We're not YouTubing this. End of interview. So God is very wise. Don't think, you know, he's in your box. He knows what he's doing. He said, I could only know what his traits were. Now listen to his traits. What he needs to be in order to be Mashiach. Number one, he is here. He must be here. It can't be that Mashiach is someone who is dead. That can't be. Number two, it has to be someone who is here who people know. But when he, come, he becomes Mashiach, everybody will be surprised. A huge surprise. And people will say, ah, that's the Messiah. It will be like, wow, that's the Mashiach? Like that. When will it happen? Number three, according to what I understood, the Geula, which is the redemption, and the revelation of Mashiach is going to happen very soon. The rabbi is not very impressed with this, as you are not. Very soon means a lot of things. Rabbi says, 
Now, tell me, when you were there, there was no concept of time. How can you estimate the concept of time? What is imminent? Is it 20 years, two years, a month? Nathan, imminent is right away, like in the coming months. Like, I can tell you that the redemption is very close to here. I understood, according to what I understood there, I am certain that I know it. When I was up there, I understood what was going to happen in the world. And according to what I understood, very bad things are going to happen. But it depends on who. Rabbi, is there a way to avert it? There is that possibility, if we all repent, that it won't happen. What's coming? Nathan. It's going to be something that is called a very big war. And everybody, the whole world, will be involved in that war, according to what I understood. The whole world will be involved in that war. Everybody. All the Goyim, that means us, the Gentiles. All the Arabs, the Muslims. Everybody will come against the nation of Israel and will fight in that war. Hey, I've been taking like the last year teaching this on end times, saying here are the nations, here's the positioning, here's what's coming next. I have to convince people through arduous study of the Scriptures, through arduous exegesis of the Scriptures, to say it's lining up now. And one boy goes up to heaven 15 minutes and comes back and says the same thing. It's unfair. But I get higher reward because I studied. I did my mitzvot of studying the Word of God. So I'm quite happy. We are in agreement. The rabbi asked, who will start it, this war? Nathan, it will begin, the person who will start the war will be someone named Gog. As far as I understood up there, only up there I understood. Now you know how many Christians have to study the Word of God to even find the word Gog. And he, without studying the word, knows this is the bad dude. We call him the, you know, possibly the Antichrist. Rabbi, and do you know who this Gog is? Nathan, I am certain who he is. Who is it? Nathan, Obama. He will be the one who starts that war. Rabbi, and he'll fight against us? Nathan, he will fight against us. At first, everybody will simply want the nation of Israel. Jerusalem, Israel, everybody will want it. They won't pay attention to us. They simply want it. Everyone will fight each other because they want it. Now, we, you know that Jerusalem, and especially the Temple Mount, is the most sought after, the most prized, the most expensive piece of real estate on the planet. Bar none. Everybody, God, the devil, prophets, infidels. Everybody wants this piece of land. But we don't know what's going to trigger the war. Now we know that there's a lot of fighting going on at the Temple Mount over the issue that only Muslims who have no historical tie to the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque was imposed there way after Jesus' ministry. Right? They have no connection, but they're fighting, not allowing, you know, Jews and Christians are not allowed to pray there. I've been up there. And technically, you're not allowed to pray up there. I mean, what, what, what an affront to the Jewish people. Imagine you live here in Melbourne and you're not allowed to pray in the CBD. I mean, no country in the world would put up with this. And yet people are against Israel. Can you imagine you're in your own country, in your own city, there's a place you're not allowed to visit and you're not allowed to pray. So Temple Mount definitely would coincide with the four blood moons because the blood moons in 1949 coincided with the state of Israel. Blood moons in 1967 coincide with the city of Jerusalem. So this blood moon in this century would coincide with something to do with the restoration of the temple. That may trigger the war. However, there's a development going on where they found some oil and some natural gas in Israel. So everybody's already positioned right next door to Israel. The Iranians are there, the Russians are there, the Americans are there. How many other people in proxy, UK, France, they're all there. And they're all gathering there as if, unnoticed, as if it's got nothing to do with Israel. And yet we've read in the Bible, all this is a stage. This is a show for the world to gather together and next would be the spillover to, into Israel. Only one thing has to happen. One bomb has to go off. One nuclear warhead gets dropped. One nuclear accident, they might call it. 
and suddenly the whole world is upon Israel, but they've been gathering the troops and the tanks and the ships and the boats there all this time. And no one except us who's reading the Bible is saying, hey, red alert, Israel, Israel, this is World War III that's coming, Ezekiel 38, 39, prophesied for nearly 3,000 years. What's the proof that the Bible is the Word of God? Fulfilled prophecy. It may take 3,000 years, but you better believe it will come to pass. So Nathan saw this, and he was very bold to say, Obama, I've never been that bold because I believe Obama is the white horse living in the White House, and he's triggering bad things. He's the false peace because he got the Nobel Peace Prize. He's the white horse. Irony, a black man in the White House being the white horse with the Nobel Peace Prize. But I never actually quite had the confidence to say that the white horse is the same as Gog or the same as Antichrist. There may be many personalities involved in this. But this boy says he's Gog. Does that mean he's the Antichrist? Maybe, maybe not. But he's Gog. He's the one that fights Israel. Is that hard to believe? No. Because anytime Christians die, rather than saying Christians are being persecuted, that's bad, all he says is, oh, the worst thing that could happen is if we get Islamophobic. If we say mean things about Muslim, that would be the worst thing. But Christians, with their heads toppling off their neck, that's not bad. And he doesn't fight. You know, he's left Christians to get persecuted all this time and has not engaged ISIS all this time until Russia finally got their plane shot down on the Sinai Peninsula and they came in. And now because it's a balance of power thing, an ego thing, he's had to step in. But he's totally allowed the slaughter of Christians and allowed the growth of radical Islam because they want a caliphate. And if it's not a caliphate of ISIS, it will be a caliphate that replaces the caliphate of ISIS. The solution to evil is evil. That's what they'll say. So everyone will be fed up with ISIS that wants a caliphate. How to get rid of them? Maybe. They, Turkey says. Saudi says. We need the true caliphate. With a very strong Muslim caliphate. With real Islam that is established on peace. Then we will get rid of ISIS. And the whole world would say, oh, that's great. United Muslim nations. You see, it's all being set up right now. And who's the Antichrist? I still am not going to say I know for sure. But Obama apparently is the Gog that leads this war against Israel. Now he says, the timing of this is quite interesting. All of that, all of the bad things will take two weeks. In those two weeks, what is the bad thing? More than a few million people will die. They will die. The only thing that saves them, according to what I understood, is only if they do teshuvah. And teshuvah is to repent. You have to repent. Then he defines it later on. Very interesting. He doesn't believe saying sorry means that you've repented. His re definition of repentance is so close to the Christian one. I'll come back to it, okay? Nathan continues, And many people from among Am Israel, that means the people of Israel, will die. Several million will die. A ton of people will die. The rabbi. Those who didn't keep Torah and mitzvot, they will die. Those who kept Torah and mitzvot, those who kept Torah and mitzvot, it depends. Very Christian answer. See, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you'd be very self-satisfied and assured. Oh, yeah, I'm, I keep the Torah. I'm Orthodox Jew. Everything's fine. He said, no, it depends. It depends if they did Torah with Gimlet Kassadim. Now, this is, got to explain this. There are those who are observant, but they don't really care about it. They are casual about it. But if someone is really strict and studies Torah, and does acts of kindness, he will be saved. Did you get that? True repentance for us is not saying, Jesus, forgive me my sin, la-di-da. No worries. He said, a true act of repentance will be accompanied by studying the Torah, which is for us studying the Bible, doing the Bible, and showing acts of kindness. How many so-called Christians you know out there say they're close to God, they, they, they've uh, forgiven others, they have uh, repented of their sins, and yet they can't be kind to people. 
They can't even smile at people. They can't show an act of kindness to people. And this guy, Nathan says, what he saw in heaven is that those people do not qualify. They will be part of the destruction, the war. We, he now, he, he begins to unravel the Jewish self-confidence. Very strange. No Jewish person would really believe this unless it's revealed to him. We, the IDF that is, will manage to keep them at bay for two days. I have been saying this. I have been preaching this from end time scriptures that the Jewish pride in their own military strength is going to be their undoing. They have won every war and rather than seeking Mashiach and saying to, to God be the glory, to the Messiah be the glory, they take all the glory to themselves. And I said, I guarantee pride comes before a fall. They're going to fall in a, in a war. They're going to completely fail. But I've never heard a Jewish person say this. I don't say this because I don't love the Jews. I say this because I love you. All the Jewish people gave us the Torah and gave us the Messiah. But you can't be confident in your own military strength. You've got to repent, do teshuva, and seek the Messiah. And his identity is very clear. He's known by everyone. So he said, they will keep them at bay for two days according to what I saw. And then everyone will simply kill us. And we won't have anyone to rely on but the Holy One. Blessed be He. The rabbi asked, who will join him? Nathan said, Iran will join him. Well, hang on. This is how many sermons have we been preaching about the next attack is from Iran? I mean, this is dissecting Daniel chapter uh, 11. This is dissecting many scriptures about Persia, Ezekiel 38, 39. This is amazing. He said, Iran will join him, will join Obama. Isn't Obama, strangely enough, a friend of Iran? giving them a nuclear deal where they can get nuclear weapons under the radar, and, and any inspection is announced like a month ahead of time. It's ridiculous. So Iran will join Obama, the UN, the whole UN. Yes, Russia, South Korea, the whole United Nations. Really, everyone, everyone, all 70 nations will rise against us. 70. Rabbi, where is ISIS in all this? Nathan, ISIS, what they will do is, this is what I saw, they will kidnap people. They will simply kidnap people. Like they did to Gilad Shalit, they will also do that. They will kidnap people and they will torture them. Next. Now what I also saw is that Har Hazitim, which is the Hebrew for the Mount of Olives, next to Jerusalem, that mountain will split in two. At the moment the mountain splits in two, in that second, the Mashiach will be revealed to everyone. Meaning, before everyone, before everyone, everyone will simply see that it's Mashiach. Everyone will understand it's the Mashiach. Here he is, revealed to everyone. And he will stand at the entrance there to Har Hazitim. You realize he's quoting Zechariah chapter 14? Again, you have to study end time scriptures. Even the, the common Christian doesn't know this. Zechariah 14, let me read it to you. Verse 4. And in that day, his feet, who? Yeshua's feet, Jesus' feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley, and half of the mountain shall move to the north and half of it toward the south. Nathan said, and the Mashiach will say, who can enter and who cannot? The rabbi asked, now, how does it open? Atomic bomb? Nathan, no, no, no. Rabbi, what? Nathan, so, Two of the dead people will rise. Two dead people will come back to life. One from here and one from there, and it will split in two. Now, come on. This boy is now quoting Revelation. This is the part of the Bible he doesn't even know about. This is Revelation chapter 11. Again, so few Christians are educated in end times, they don't even know this. Let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses... 
of Revelation, the two Jewish witnesses. These are not Jehovah Witnesses, okay? These are Jeho Jewish witnesses. Most of the Jehovah Witnesses are Gentiles. They're so deluded to think that there are 144,000 Jews. That's in Revelation 7 and 14. It says Jews. The two witnesses are Jews. When they finish their testimony, in verse 7 of chapter 11, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. That's a prophecy of television, folks. Internet. How can the bodies of somebody in a specific locale, Jerusalem, be viewed by every nation on earth for three days. You don't believe we're living in the end times? We're almost there at this event. It could happen this year. This boy says it's within months. You know, a, a great preacher said within the first five minutes of entering into eternity, we will have wished that we prayed more, gave more, grieved more, loved more, preached more, within five minutes of being in eternity, we'll realize it's over. Never again. What if we had those last, metaphorically speaking, those last five minutes are upon us? How do we live? How do we pray? How do we love? How do we talk about other people? How do we share about God? I think we would live differently if we really, really believed this. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. This is called the satanic Christmas. They make merry over godly men being murdered. But it's happening already. You know that. They don't care about Christians being murdered. They care if a Muslim is murdered. But they don't care if Christians are beheaded. And they send gifts to one another. Imagine the vile, despicable, abominable depravity of man. You send gifts because two preachers of God are murdered. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. I guess it would. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and their enemies saw them, and the same hour uh, and a tenth of the city fell. And in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Thank God a few people get saved from that. So here's a recap, okay? What's going to happen? Here's what uh, we know from Nathan about the Messiah. The Messiah is, first of all, someone who can't sin. Now, we listening to this, we already know his name, Yeshua. Someone who can't sin, who didn't commit any trans uh, transgression. He didn't commit even one transgression. It can't be that the Mashiach is someone who committed transgressions. I mean, this is him verbatim. Now, it can be someone who we actually know very well, who we know very well. Let me tell you something. When God wants to pick someone whom we know very well, He means the one we know very well. The most famous human on earth. The calendar is pegged to His birth. Jesus Christ. Think about it. Choose is the most obvious thing. Your Messiah is Jesus. Yeshua. Lots and lots of people. So He says, we know very well. We, when He says we, He doesn't mean us. He means the Jews. He says, first of all, the Jews know him very well. Then he says, lots and lots of people know him. He means us, the Gentiles. Actually, according to what I understood. But everyone will be very, very surprised that he is of all people, the Mashiach. This Mashiach will fight against Obama. And not only that, he will kill him and bury him in the land of Israel. Think about that. Now I'll show you in a second. That's Scripture. I bet you, you didn't even know that, that God will be buried in Israel. I'll show it to you. And I saw 
that the moment that Har Hazitim, the Mount of Olives, splits into two, then the Mashiach will stand at the entrance and he won't see who is religious or who has a beard. What he will see, he sees according to a person's holiness. He will smell each person. He will smell if someone has holiness, if he is pure, if he did mitzvot, if he performed acts of kindness, to see if he really had the true fear of heaven and not just the fear of punishment. Do you know that if you just are afraid of being punished, you're probably not a Christian? You have to have the true fear of your Father, the fear of displeasing our Father. We don't walk in fear of going to hell. We walk in fear of displeasing our loving, wonderful Father. We won't say certain things. We won't do certain things because we walk in the fear of our Father God. He'll smell it. He won't say, here you are, you have a hat, you have a kippah, so like that, you can go in. It's not like that. I mean, really, he will have a certain power that he will be able to feel what is truly inside every person. Who is he describing if not Jesus Christ, the Messiah? Rabbi, that means a week ago you didn't know this? Nathan, I did not know these things. I didn't know. I had no idea. <laughs> then the rabbi turns to Ezekiel 39 and quotes verse 11. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers because there they will bury Obama. Let's put it that way. If he's right, now we know we can update a very, it's a very strange man, Obama, don't you think? Nobody can agree. Where did he come from? How can a senator from Chicago suddenly become president? Is he born in Hawaii? Is he born in Kenya? I mean, we don't even know. Trump says his birth certificate is fake. I mean, this is a very mysterious man. The first man ever to be president, and both his father and stepfather are Muslims. And he has no kind thing to say about Christianity, and he bows to the Saudi king, kowtows to him full on. I mean, we're, we got a person who's very mysterious, very hard to describe. Maybe God says, ah, forget it, call him Gog. And we're all tearing our hair, figuring out who's God, who's God, and we're looking up this and that. Well, maybe it's meant to be a bit of a mystery. Maybe the man of mystery is the man of mystery. And the man of mystery is Obama. Why, why a guy who's never done anything for peace, who started more wars and killed more people and didn't close Guantanamo Bay and got Gaddafi murdered and got Saddam Hussein killed, how come this guy gets the high, supposedly on this world, the highest peace, the Nobel Peace Prize. So Ezekiel 39, verse 11, says the, the people who are traveling in Israel are going to get obstructed by the body of Obama because they will bury Obama and all his multitude. Therefore, they will call it the Valley of Hamon Gog. Nathan says that is exactly what will happen if things continue as they are, like if the world keeps going on like this. That is exactly what will happen for certain According to what I saw, it has already started. The rabbi says, it's already started. When did it already start? He says, on the day 27 of Elul. And remember, when, when we were preaching about end times, we were preaching around that day, saying the, the pieces have fallen into place. You go and look at all my sermons about the blood moon and all the 21 future events of Revelation, World War III. We've been talking about this. And he said, it started on September 11, 2015. This war already started because the Holy One, blessed is He, will not bring it in the beginning. What will happen is one day, everything will explode. Something will happen to cause everything to escalate. And we will know instantly that we are in full-blown war and everyone will say, World War III has started, has begun. That's it. There's no time left. Rabbi, so you are saying that there will be some sort of security breach that will blow out of proportion and they will be fighting one another? What about us, Nathan? 
At first we will be excluded from this, but after they will unite against us. Right? So we got some history for the, some, uh, not history, prophecy for the Jews. If you're a Jew, don't put your trust only in the IDF and your military and economic power. You need to turn to Mashiach and do Teshuva. If you're a nominal Christian, if you're not sure you're a Christian, if you're just a Sunday churchgoer, if you're a church hopper, you need to do Teshuva. You really need to forgive people in your lives that you think hurt you, and you need to do acts of kindness. It's not time to play around. This is time to really show acts of kindness. This is time to make absolutely sure that our faith and our repentance is genuine, that our relationship with God is solid by the blood sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah. We have been made clean. Therefore, we fear displeasing God, not fear going to hell. Amen. If there's any sense of fear of going to hell, we need to repent tonight. We need to repent right now and ask Jesus, the, the Messiah, to come into our hearts. And you can do that right now. I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes and pray. There are people who are listening, and I believe there are many Jewish people who, whose eyes God is opening right now to show your own scriptures, your own Mashiach. We've quoted from your scriptures that you've given to us. We are indebted to you. Now we give you back the gift that you need to receive. Accept the Mashiach, the Messiah, before it's too late, before the, the atom bomb goes off, before war starts. There'll be no time. You can't even respond to the, silent, the sirens in time. Accept your Messiah now, I pray. If you want to do that, pray these words out of your own heart, out of your own lips. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, I do teshuva. I repent for my sins. I'm sorry for rejecting you for not studying Torah, for not doing mitzvot, for not obeying the commands of the Bible. Now I give my life to the Messiah, the one who can save me. I trust in Him, not my good deeds, not my righteousness, for I have none. My good deeds are as dirty rags before you, God. Thank you for accepting me and making me your child. I pray that right now my name would be written in the book of life, in heaven's book, now and forever. I belong to Hashem. I belong to God. Thank you, Lord, for I am now sinless. Help me to live for eternity. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, it's my privilege to uh, pray with you and to bring this message to you. I thank God that He's speaking to uh, Jewish boys, Christian boys. We're really on the same side. We're in the same family. And uh, Christians are friends of Israel and Jews, and I hope that the Jews will realize Christ has taken the wall of partition away. He's taken the wall of enmity the New Testament calls it. He's taken all of that away. And we are one family. We're the seed of Abraham. He's coming soon. And if you're a Muslim, you also have a Messiah. It's Jesus. All right? So please turn to Yeshua and all this fighting and all this violence can end. In Jesus' name. Amen.